Uh, we're here today uh, to do uh, the 12th meeting on the Maritime Transportation uh, Data Initiative. We've got a great panel uh, of, uh, of experts here, uh, uh, largely in the uh, standard setting uh, arena. Uh, the government uh, um, uh, representative from NIST, Gordon Gillerman, uh, Tom Sprout uh, from the Global Network uh, Development uh, Trade Lens, which is a uh, private sector uh, blockchain uh, organization working on blockchain technology and Dominique Willems, uh, head of public affairs and government relations for uh, DC uh, SA. Um, uh, both of the former uh, last two are actually participants in agreements at the Federal Maritime Commission that authorizes their ability to continue to uh, do these sort of activities. But uh, we look forward to hearing from them uh, in a, in, a, in a second, but I did want to uh, uh, make a statement today. Uh, U.S. Senate uh, Commerce Committee took action uh, to pass legislation reauthorizing the, the activities of, fe of the Federal Maritime Commission. So I uh, wanted to applaud uh, Chairwoman Catwell, Ranking Member Wicker, uh, Senator Thune and Klobuchar, who also worked very hard on the passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act through committee. Uh, it's, uh, S3580, uh, uh, they also passed the Freight Act, uh, uh, S3262. Uh, it's been uh, uh, over 25 years, close to 25 years, since Congress has updated our stat statutes on shipping policies uh, and funding issues. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, uh, I was uh, a participant in the original drafting of what was the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2008. And so, uh, uh, so it's with some uh, trepidation that you acknowledge that your uh, legislation is being overtaken 25 years later. Um, but uh, pandemics uh, highlighted and focused our need for ocean shipping and, a, and an op ocean shipping industry that works well. And so I was really happy to see uh, that they're looking to revitalize our efforts uh, to update our statutes and to uh, allow us to move forward basically in a new, uh, new regime uh, for, for ocean shipping. We're really uh, struggling with uh, the volumes of trade that are coming in. So we, we need to do things better. Uh, and I wanted to in particular, uh, thank the staff. I was a staffer on the Senate Commerce Committee for many years and worked, uh, uh, and I know uh, how long and hard they, they worked on the legislation. Uh, so I'd like to congratulate them on passage of, of that. Nicole Tuchel, Dave Stewart, Alexis uh, Gutierrez, Eric Breihard from the, uh, uh, the Senate Majority, uh, and Andrew Neely, Paul Wasik, uh, and Kyle Fields all should be uh, acknowledged for all of their efforts in doing that. I think it's a real positive step. And while we have some, some issues remaining to, uh, to see uh, ultimate passage of this legislation, uh, I think it's a, a great step forward and, and, and would thank the committee for all of their efforts. Um, uh, so uh, again, this is our 12th meeting and today we will, we will be discussing international standards. We will hear from the Commerce Department, NIST. Uh, uh, Gordon, I worked on the Senate Commerce Committee and, and, and worked uh, closely with NIST as, as a, a staffer there. Um, uh, the uh, uh, DCSA uh, and Trade Lens representatives, uh, as I outlined before, are here to pr provide an, uh, perspectives on uh, industry coordination efforts and, and standard setting uh, and, and utilization, I think, of, of those standards uh, uh, for the future. Um, um, a few things. Uh, um, participants have been forwarded questions, so we'll jump right into those. These meetings are being recorded and will be posted on the FMC YouTube page and on the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative webpage. Uh, please, if one of the participants uh, chooses to uh, share something, use the share function. I think we're we're okay on that, but uh, uh, we would like the public be, uh, to be able to review any information. I also want to point out that this is a live public meeting. Only participants will be able to speak. We will be posting the meeting on the MTDI uh, webpage for public access. However, we welcome, uh, in fact, encourage public input. We just received something from a Department of Agricultural recently, and so we're going to be posting that. Uh, you can email us with your feedback on data gaps and data needs at maritime data 
at fmc.gov, it says it sounds. Uh, should you choose to submit public uh, feedback, please reference whether it is in reference to this meeting in this individual meeting or whether it is a general comment. Also, we will be uh, posting submitted materials and comments on our web page. We cannot post PowerPoint so that we ask that materials be submitted in Word or PDF format. Please uh, do not include any personal identifiable information, PII, on any submissions uh, to the FMC. We will continue these meetings every Tuesday at 3 p.m. I think we're going to be uh, ramping up a little bit as we uh, talk to the marine terminals and uh, ocean carriers. Uh, and it's leading up to a uh, FMC Maritime Transportation Data Initiative Summit this spring. I, we look forward to working with all of the people and the representatives that we work with. Uh, we're tentatively uh, looking at a, a date very early in June. Uh, I'll keep it under wraps uh, until we've finalized it. And if you haven't seen it, please look uh, at the FMC YouTube uh, channel on our webpage to review the, uh, the meetings that we've had. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from each of the participants today. And uh, I've got uh, my counsel here, John Young, and our uh, Bureau of Transportation Analysis uh, uh, Chief Economist, uh, uh, Kristen. Monaco uh, here as well, so we may uh, be uh, interjecting as, as time permits. Uh, so I'm going to go in order. Uh, Gordon uh, Gillerman, Department of Commerce, he can give us some some uh, expertise on standard setting in general and, and some of the things that we should be looking at as we as we go through the process of uh, evaluating standards. Uh, and then uh, Dominique. Uh, from DCSA, a Digital Container uh, Shipping Association, and then Tom uh, Sprout uh, from Trade Lens. Don't worry about uh, about being redundant. It's helpful to hear hear uh, what you want to say, and so we've got a lot of time, and uh, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, so, uh, Gordon, why don't, why don't you lead off? Terrific. And I just want to thank the commissioners. And for everything. Now, can everybody mute their microphones? So I do want to thank the commissioners and all the staff uh, for the opportunity to come here and talk. Um, I come from a different world, so hopefully I can talk a little bit uh, broadly about uh, successes and standards. Um, but I really do want to start a little bit with uh, our institute. So NIST is the National Metrology Institute of the United States of America. Um, so we're the reason that things that get measured here can get sold abroad without having to be remeasured. Um, in addition to that, we do research in cutting edge measurement science. We've recently replaced the kilogram artifact um, with an experiment that can be realized just about anywhere in the world um, to make measurement science easier and more accessible for all of industry. And we also do a lot of work in research and technology areas like communications technology and information technology, such as data. And one of the things about the world that I work in is it's the world of documentary standards. So these are standards that used to be published like books or magazines and now are available as PDFs or HTMLs on the internet. And they differ from measurement standards uh, because it's not about an unbroken chain of traceability to measurements made around the world and comparisons of those measurements, but really it's about the consensus of the community in ways to evaluate things, ways to behave, ways to operate that's really important in standardization. It's this rules of engagement that can be used repeatedly so everybody knows what to expect. So we here in the United States are really, really different. In other countries, many of them have a centralized top-down standardization system. At the top of that pyramid is a government organization or an anointed private sector body by the government who is the national standards body. We don't have a system like that. We have a standard system that reflects our industry, our competitive culture. We have lots of standards developers here in the United States. We have a private sector organization that we work very closely called the American National Standards Institute, who organizes much of the private sector effort in standards as well as the many of the organizations that produce standards in the United States of America. But we do have laws that talk about standards and I'll talk about one of the important ones. So there are some standards provisions in something called the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act. And the message is clear. US government agencies should participate in the development of voluntary consensus standards and use those standards in lieu of developing government unique standards. Clear and simple. 
It gives NIST a role in coordinating participation and use of standards across the federal government with the private sector. It also gives NIST a role in coordinating what's called conformity assessment activities. Most people would understand that as testing, certification, and accreditation type activities. Again, across the federal government and with the private sector. All of this to increase our efficiency, our capabilities, to make us more competitive and better traders in the global marketplace. So what is it that the agencies should be doing? The agencies should be working with standards development bodies who use reasonable processes that have transparency, balance of interests, and due process in order to develop standards to meet their needs. In these standards environments, the agencies are not dominating entities. Staff from agencies are members. They have an equal voice with all of the other materially interested participants in the standards development process. We hope that the standards that come out of that process help the agency meet their mission needs. The agencies can then choose to use them. If they're regulatory agencies, they can incorporate them by reference and regulations. So any of you who have children, there's a lot of toys out there for which ASTM standards are incorporated in regulations to help keep your children safe. There are standards that are used by federal agencies as the way they operate. So I work closely with the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory, the people who actually test and certify N95 masks that we all heard so much about. They operate in accordance with an international standard in their laboratory called ISO IEC 17025, a general set of requirements for a good quality and risk management system that underlies laboratory operations. They didn't write that standard. They didn't even participate in that standard, but they adopted that standard for use because it helps them do their job better. And that really is the ethos of our look as a government on voluntary consensus standards developed by private sector standards bodies, is they're valuable. They're ways for us to avoid redundancy, to interoperate with the private sector in ways that make our work more efficient and the societal benefit of the agency's work greater. And help industry, especially US industry, be more productive and more competitive internationally. So these are really the things that come to the top of mind that we think about when we work on international standards. I happen to chair something called the Interagency Committee on Standards Policy. So this is part of executing that role of organizing participation and use of standards across the government. And I get to encounter a lot of work that the agencies are doing in standards, the way they're using standards. And I thought it might be helpful to talk about a couple of these experiences. And really, I'm going to focus on one. Um, so we're all participating here virtually for the most part. There's a lot of standards in the chain of communication between me and you. One of them is something that we classically call Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is actually based on a standard made by the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE 802.11. So if you ever looked at the back of your Wi-Fi box or any product that's Wi-Fi, it'll tell you what version of Wi-Fi 802.11 that that product conforms to. This is a standard whose adoption and use is not regulated. The marketplace wants it. You can't buy a computer that doesn't meet 802.11. And if you see the Wi-Fi logo on a product, it's not a government agency's logo. It's the logo of a consortium of organizations who want you to have confidence that those products actually can interoperate with wireless router systems around the world. So this is one example of how standards work in the absence of the need for regulation. But that doesn't mean that regulators don't get value in standards. As we say, toy safety has seen tremendous value in adopting standards. Another commission, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, has used standards in their work for decades. They participate heavily in the development of these standards, make sure that the industry understands the expectations for toy safety that the regulator has. And it doesn't mean that the standards are insufficient that they can't take additional action. But it really helps to set a level playing field, a way for industry, stakeholders, and government to engage on developing a set of technical requirements that can work for different communities. And that community of action is really, really important. So I got engaged in a community of action during the pandemic that most of you are probably not aware of, but might have interfaced with. 
So one of the things that was really interesting in the pandemic was that people started needing to wear masks. And what most people still don't really understand is that the mask that you've worn to the grocery store isn't really to protect you. It's source control to protect everybody else, just like the masks that doctors and nurses wear when you go to the hospital and you have a procedure done. It's trying to limit the ability for the mask wearer to spread an infection if they have one to others. So this idea of source control is really, really core and important, but personal protective equipment and source control, N95s are made as personal protective equipment to be used when you're in a hazardous respiratory environment, generally in a workplace, but nowadays they have other uses. But we needed to develop a standard for something that was kind of in between. Because if you've ever worn an N95 and had it fitted, you know it's something you really don't wear for, want to wear for a long period of time, especially if you're exerting yourself. So ASTM, largest US domicile standards development body in the United States, worked very, very closely with stakeholders in the respiratory protection and source control industries and stakeholders, including myself, the FDA, NIOSH, CDC, the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory, we spun up a standards development process to develop a standard that's now published as the standard for facial barriers. We didn't want to call it something that would be mistaken for something else. That standard was developed and published in seven months. And we had users from the medical community. We had users from the occupational safety community. We had all the regulators from the US government and some states engaged. We also had people from the procurement side of the world at the state level who are buying a lot of these kinds of products and sending them out to be used in their state governments and in their healthcare facilities. That standards development process, we leveraged existing work. We didn't feel the need to create everything from whole cloth. There was already good test methods out there that we adapted. And we created a standard that has levels of performance for particle filtering efficiency. So when you see an N95, that means it meets 95 percentile of particle filtering efficiency in that cornerstone test. But we created lower levels of acceptable performance. And we also created levels of breathability to how comfortable is it to wear for long periods of time. The standard is now in use. There are lots of organizations producing products that conform to the standard. And the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory has stood up a website where you can find organizations who've had their products tested at accredited laboratories demonstrated their conformity to the performance, construction, and conformity assessment requirements of the standard so you can use them. This only happened because those stakeholders felt comfortable in this voluntary consensus standards development environment. It had a set of rules that make sure that the interests of the different categories of persons and organizations involved were balanced so we didn't have the manufacturers dominating the standards development. We didn't have the regulators dominating standards development. We really had an equal stake in this. There were also prescribed rules. What must be published to the drafting group? What must be balloted? How much balloting percentage do you need to go forward? What happens when people have negative comments about drafts of the documents? All these rules in ASTM's process are published, understood, and known, and it provides for a level of due process that gave all those stakeholders confidence that we could produce a document that would identify products that performed reasonably well for Americans and others to wear in their daily lives to reduce themselves as a source control and provide a certain level of protection against being infected. I'm really proud of the work we did here. We did it in a lightning amount of time. Seven months from beginning to publication is really world record time in standards land. And we did it on an issue that had direct immediate health and societal impact. So this can be done. The importance of the outreach that was done by the initiators of the standard at the beginning to make sure that the communities of stakeholders knew that this was happening and had an opportunity to participate materially in the process was most important. Because people who left out, people who get left out in standards tend to get engaged late and bomb the process at the end. And we didn't want that. We wanted a collaborative process. We wanted everybody's interests on the table. We negotiated, we compromised, and we moved forward, and we created an effective standard, and we're already in revision two right now. So this is the kind of process 
that the public and private sector can be in partnership on and work to make things work better. The other important piece was the business case. We had to make sure that the manufacturers of these products had a business case for bringing these products to the marketplace. Not just a business case because there was a big need out there, but there's no regulation that all masks have to meet this requirement. So we made the conformity assessment process relatively straightforward, easy, and accessible, even for small and medium-sized manufacturers who had been converting their operations to make these widely needed products. So it's very important to understand the importance of the business case. If we build it, why will they come? So my message to you is there are aspects of standards development, there's outreach to the stakeholders, there's these elements of due process, and there's business case. And we have to pay attention to all those things to have successful standards. Thank you. You're on mute. Uh, thanks, Gordon. That was a really good overview of the process of, uh, of setting standards from, from the mac uh, macro perspective. And we're, I, I guess we're wrestling here and, and I've dealt with uh, missed uh, standards uh, before the process. And, and, and for instance, uh, and, uh, and toy products and, and toys uh, and other uh, 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 products. And in this case, we're looking at services pro provided by the uh, by uh, di uh, different segments of the transportation industry. And so it's, it's a lot murkier than, uh, than some of the other areas that we've engaged in in standard setting, but we'll just have to wrestle with that. But I, I really liked your, uh, your advice uh, on, on the process of moving forward with uh, standard setting. Uh, with that, we'll turn to uh, Dominique. Uh, go ahead and talk uh, about what you've been do doing with the uh, Digital Container uh, Shipping Association, your efforts get the industry uh, we we've had uh gordon you'd be happy to hear we've reached out to them early on in the process and said we know you've been working on this already and we want to work with you uh to to determine uh, how those standards are are apl applicable to the industry uh so go ahead and and and, and talk about what you're working on thank you um thank you commissioner Benzel. it's an absolute pleasure to uh to contribute to the uh, fmc data initiative um, maybe good if I first explain a bit uh, what DCSA is and, and, and how, how we do our work. Uh, so we are a global, neutral and nonprofit association. And uh, we have the goal to ensure the widespread adoption of digital standards in container shipping to um, <clears throat> make that maybe a bit more simple. Uh, well, Wi-Fi was used already before as an example, uh, uh, but you can compare it also with email. Um, Every person has uh, a different email accounts, which can be used on different apps and on different devices. And regardless of that, you can exchange it with anybody else using any other uh, email accounts, app device, and so on. And that is possible because of an, an, an underlying protocol that, uh, that, is, uh, that is making that happen. And that's, that's exactly what we uh, do too when it comes to digitalization and container shipping. So, we do that because we know that there is a need to improve the efficiency and the reliability and just the overall customer experience in shipping. And, and that's something that our members have realized actually already a year before the pandemic happened and, and the current supply chain issues in the US happened. So this is really shows that, that, that also within the industry, even before there was an immediate need to change it, um, this, this is something we, we really, uh, um, considered very important to work on. Um, our standards evolve around three main themes, so to say. Uh, the first one is in, uh, in shipping and port operations. Uh, for example, we have uh, standards on operational vessel schedules, standards on uh, port call optimization, and other things relating to that. We also have standards on e-documentation, where I guess the, the, the most known one is on the electronic bill of lading. And lastly, we have standards on uh, creating more visibility and traceability of containers. Uh, all of our standards are free to use. They're completely openly published online. You don't even need to provide an email address to access them. And uh, we really think it's important that uh, when setting standards that we do that in a neutral way, whether that is neutral towards any kind of technology, but also neutral to any kind of commercial actor out there, any kind of platform out there and so on. 
And the way we make our standards is, is through a lot of collaboration, both on the input and on the output side. So on the input side, we do not necessarily reinvent the wheel. Uh, there are actually already really a lot of standards out there, whether that's ISO, UN standards, IMO standards, and so on and so on. And it's not so much that there is a lack of standards, there might be an abundance of standards at a global scale. And, and, and what we do is try to combine them, uh, mostly try to make them operational. So to make sure that the companies which need to use them can actually use them in their day-to-day -day practices. And, and on the output side also, we, 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 uh, we try to make that open and, and, and as inclusive as possible by um, um, uh, discussing it with, well, obviously shipping experts, technology experts, standardization experts, uh, uh, platform providers such as Trade Lens, uh, but probably most importantly with the customers of the shipping line. So you've asked us uh, to, to tell you about some unexpected obstacles that we see in standard setting. And standard setting in itself, um, well, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's, it's not the most difficult part either. As, as I said, uh, there is already quite an abundance of standards out there. It's a matter of picking, combining the right ones and making them operational. Uh, also convincing people of uh, uh, the benefits of the standards, we don't find that difficult either. Everybody we talk to basically says, yes, this is absolutely necessary. Yes, we should go there someday. But bringing that to the operational practice at a global level, that's a lot more difficult. And well, actually we have a whole list of obstacles that we're trying to address, but for today, I'll, I'll mention the three main ones. And the first one we see is, um, that there always seems to be something else to do today. I've worked myself over more than 20 years in, in transport and logistics, uh, starting at an operational level as a transport planner, freight forwarder, customs broker. I even have a certificate to operate a crane. And I know from this operational practice that there is always some issue, something going on that you need today and any kind of improvement or innovation that's for tomorrow. But by the time tomorrow comes, there is again an issue that needs to be addressed today. So that really needs to be resolved at some point. Uh, second big issue that we see is that parties seem to be waiting for each other. As I said, nobody really needs to be convinced, but they're waiting for each, each other. So you see maybe the carrier waiting for the customer, the customer waiting for its uh, solution provider, and the solution provider, again, in turn, waiting for the carrier. And this keeps on going in circles often, and, and that needs to be broken through at some point. And one of the last ones that I would like to mention are um, well, regulatory barriers. Um, it was said in a couple of uh, meetings ago in the data initiative that it's strange how it's possible to track a pizza, but it's not possible to track a container. And well, first of all, there is a bit more complexity. You're moving it across different borders, across different modes of transport. And there are a lot of parties involved along the chain who have to hand over both the goods and the data to each other, not necessarily having any kind of um, uh, uh, commercial relationship with each other. And on top of that, you have to use different technologies and different communication networks, uh, which include satellite connections, mobile network connections, uh, radio frequencies, and so on. That's already quite difficult. But the, the regulatory issues that we see is not, not necessarily that it prevents it from tracking containers, but it really doesn't make it any easier either. If you look at the tracking devices themselves, they contain batteries and the batteries can be what is called a source of, of ignition. So meaning that it can cause a fire on a ship. And that's all, of course, something that needs to be prevented absolutely regardless, whatever. But the safety rules around that are so immensely uh, uh, complex and elaborate. There are multiple international conventions all referring to each other, all having many, many provisions, not even pointing out anything specifically towards tracking devices. But again, then they refer to, for example, IEC standards that were mentioned, uh, ISO mentions that were standards that were mentioned. And we have a collection of 40 on just one sim single tracking device. That doesn't give necessarily the business case that was, that was mentioned before to equip each and every container, which are millions out there with these devices, no matter how much the industry would like to do that. So, we at DCSA try to address those barriers. And the first one is, is by trying to make it easy to implement the standards. We provide support, we provide all kinds of documentation. 
Uh, we even have what we call a sandbox where um, the, 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 the standards can be, can be tested and validated. And we publish on, on, on different developer hubs where uh, the developers can easily access it. Also to break through that circle, collaboration, first of all, in the private sector is very much nece necessary. We mentioned also before that, that consensus needs to exist. And uh, there we have, well, different ways, but one recent example is through the, the, the so-called FIT Alliance, which we launched a couple of weeks ago. FIT stands for the Future of International Trade. And there we work together with the ICC, Fiata, BIMCO, and also SWIFT, which is known from the banking, to make sure that all different parties worldwide come together and, and, and really push and break through those barriers that, uh, that, that I've mentioned before. And lastly, we have uh, I mentioned that also already, we have a lot of collaboration on the public sector side. International level, it's with different UN bodies like the IMO, UN CFAC. Uh, ISO we work a lot together with, and we are a liaison and different, different groups at ISO as well. And uh, 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 very soon we will also launch a, a new partnership with the World Customs Organization. At national level, well, last week uh, the White House uh, launched its, uh, its flow initiative, which we are very happy to support, but obviously we are also very happy to support the FMC's initiative. Um, if there would be any advice that I could give you in the short few minutes that, uh, that we have today, I'm also happy to put that in writing and more elaborately, but uh, uh, some advice that we, we would like to give to the FMC is in the first place, keep doing what you're doing. Everything I've mentioned before is fully aligned with what we set out to do a couple of years ago. And I think that uh, uh, an agency like the FMC is really key for breaking through those barriers that I mentioned before. A second advice would be to not make digital standards a goal in itself. That might be strange uh, uh, for someone from a standardization body uh, to say that, but the eventual goal should be increased efficiency. And we have seen in other parts of the world where digital standards were created, but it became a goal in itself and it was over-engineered and complexity, uh, dependencies and, and costs only increased and didn't make it necessarily more simple. So that Keeping that simple would be really a, 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 a strong advice we would like to give you. We would also like to say, well, don't reinvent the wheel. I don't think you have any intention to do so, uh, but reuse what already works uh, uh, out there. Uh, like we do at DCSA, uh, so we collect different standards, we make them fit, fill in the gaps where needed, and, uh, and then ensure that it's actually adopted. And the last advice for today but again, I don't think I really need to give you that advice, but still wanted to emphasize it is collaboration. Uh, collaboration with other government agencies, whether that's at federal level or at state level. Also internationally with some of the bodies that I mentioned before, because the, the, the journey of a container usually doesn't start or end within the United States. So making that supply chain work as a whole, you need to address the different parts of the, of the chain as well. And lastly, with the private sector, but. I'm very happy also to see uh, that Gordon mentioned the, the importance of that too. And in this case, I think it's in particular important because what you get with data sharing is, is, is similar to what is called um, Chinese whispers, where um, along the chain, along the different parties exchanging information with each other, we see that what is told at the, at the very beginning of that chain is different from what comes out at the end. And unfortunately, government uh, uh, authorities are usually at the end of that chain. And that means that the information you get is not always necessarily reliable or at the highest quality. So staying closer to what is already at the source from the industry um, will really make sure that, that eventual goals of increased data quality and availability will, uh, will improve. And so, yeah, I guess well, collaboration is key. Uh, happy to see that, that that was also emphasized by, by Gordon. And we really think that the FMC is on the right track and, and are very much looking forward to further contributing to the data initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. That was great. Uh, I, I think we are uh, trying to hew to uh, both principles that both uh, Gordon and, and you espouse. We, we, we know we, uh, uh, this is a difficult issue because it is service related and we're not going to get the levels of information that we might get over certain more confined trades. I mean, we're spanning from the movement of a from a factory in China to Paducah, Kentucky, with uh, multiple actors being involved in the transport uh, through the the entire chain. So, 
So I think those were really good comments. I appreciate them. Uh, we will continue to work closely with your organization because they've taken a lead uh, step in, in, in uh, standardization. So we look forward to meeting with you and uh, to discuss these in detail um, at a later date and your continued participation in this, this effort is, is critical. Uh, so Tom, we'll turn it over to you right now. Talk about trade lanes and how standards and digital uh, communications affect uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to address this forum. Uh, and it's really interesting to hear Gordon and the NIST team describe how they develop standards. And you hear from Dominique and the DCSA team about how they collaborate with so many parties to get agreement on standards. And I think what you'll hear from Traylands is the story about the adoption of standards and the use of standards in a business context. Um, so as I mentioned a couple of times about public-private partnerships and, and as trade, lane, trade lens, we've done a number of public-private uh, initiatives with the UN and others. But first, probably seeing the audience members, I should just describe what uh, trade lens is. So trade lens is an industry neutral platform. It's blockchain enabled. Um, we're based in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, and with the mission to help digitize the industry. So that's not just on the sharing of events, but the sharing of documents that are needed for customs entry and the like. Um, at its core, uh, TradeLens has uh, two thirds of ocean container shipping on its platform. So the carriers, Maersk, CMA, MSC, Hatpeg, ONE, Zimline, Seaboard, and, and a few others uh, comprises just about 66% of, of global trade. Um, so when a carrier is on TradeLens, it's sharing every booking, every bill, every event globally to the platform. And in addition, we have uh, you know, over a thousand different uh, members connected to trade lens globally, ports, terminals, rails, depots, uh, customs. Now actually we're particularly strong in the US where we have most of the rails and, and many of the largest terminals connected to trade lens already. And this is where the standards come into play. So, um, Without the good work that's been done already by DCSA in setting the standards, it enables trade lens to be interoperable with uh, port and rail operators, with uh, port community systems globally. So you could see that we're taking those standards and just by having everyone on one platform, we are reinforcing the, the issue of standards and, and how we interchange data with each other. Um, so at its core, TradeLens, it's a distributed ledger. So we connect parties globally. Everyone that comes onto the platform is a known entity uh, and they come on per a specific role. So that dictates in that distributed ledger what data they can see and what data they can send. So you can see how important uh, standards are in this environment to be able to do that in near real time for people to see not just they're sending an outgate event, but what are the standards around that event? How big is it? What does it have in it? How does it comprise it? And how does it land on trade lines for customers to consume? Um, so yeah, you can see this theme of standards uh, you know, being the grease that makes the wheels go, go round, They're super important. Um, so for our approach, um, you know, setting standards, I think Dominique said this, it, it's been elusive. Um, it's an industry that's still very reliant upon paper documents, um, bill of ladings and documents that go back to the Phoenicians. I mean, we're, we really need to, to digitize. And I, I do think and see the FMC is really well positioned to step in and, and reinforce this. Um, so engaging with uh, the global entities, uh, as uh, Dominique was saying, is, is what's important to us. We wanna make sure we're not creating standards just for trade lens, that these are standards that can be, uh, data can be shared interoperable with, with everybody. Uh, so without that, um, we would be nowhere. And then to reinforce that, trade lens publishes their APIs on tradelens.com for everyone to yeah, see yeah. and make use of and hopefully even copy. So where we try to make a difference in this space is uh, actually by just the sheer momentum of having so much data on the platform from the carriers and connected members. That is in fact, reinforcing 
enforcing at the same time the use and adoption of standards and, and exchanging data interoperable. Um, ultimately, for data to have value, it must be shared. And this is critical. We have to be able to share it efficiently. I think that's really the main driver of why we're all together on these initiatives is to find the best way to share the data with each other in a automated fashion. So some of the obstacles that, that we've seen. So again, we're dealing with trade lens is global. We see it in every country, every port community system, every terminal or rail around the world. Um, so I think what the industry needs is, is standards to help achieve a vision of cheaper, easier, uh, less risky trading environment. Um, there have been some great examples already spoken about uh, Wi-Fi and a few others, but actually the creation of the World Wide Web, which is maybe the biggest uh, public private partnership uh, that was created. Um, this was you know, done through the leaderships in an environment where all the incentives were aligned to achieve success. And there are also a few legacy systems to deal with. So I think what Dominique faces is, you know, there are a lot of legacy systems, a lot of uh, legacy, even organizations that, that he's trying to corral and, and bring forward here. So the public private partnership is the way to go. I, I mentioned briefly earlier that TradeLens does this with the UN and their Asakuda global software, where we've created uh, together with them a uh, central data hub to, which is reliant upon standards to share not only data, but, but documents through that. Um, so yeah, the, the sheer proliferation of, of the uh, standards bodies, uh, it's good to see that it's starting to come together and share a bit more. Um, you know, policy was mentioned earlier and, you know, regulatory policy always lags, lags technology. And we see that over and over and over. So. For us to be able to get value from data, to share data, you know, we're gonna to need to make sure that regulations uh, enable people to do that. And there are, you know, what we've seen are legitimate reasons in countries where their laws prevent them from sharing in, in an economical fashion. And we've actually seen very good examples during the pandemic of countries very quickly changing their regulations and, and laws in their Congresses and parliaments to be able to go to digital documents and the like. So it is possible. And, and I think the more the public-private partnerships uh, proliferate, the, the stronger we'll be. Um, <clears throat> so I think for what TradeLens has been successful in doing is, is bringing these groups together to drive standardization, but more importantly, adoption. <clears throat> that was my opening comment that uh, what you see is what we talked about earlier about how standards are created and, and how we, we can collaborate together by having one global platform that the majority of carriers are on and many of the ports and terminals globally are on, it is by de facto taking those standards, lifting them up and putting them in production. So adoption is uh, the ultimate goal of, of all of us with standards is that it gets used and, and proliferated. Um, <clears throat> So advice for the FMC, um, again, the key objective with all of the standards is to ensure it's adopted and used. And uh, we encourage the FMC to focus on the analysis and the adoptability of the standards and recognize the industry has a long way to go still to be uh, optimally standardized. But uh, I think by working together, this is, I think the FMC is well positioned to, to accomplish this. Um, so, we believe TradeLens approach open neutral platform for the supply chain industry based in the US is a proven solution uh, that can help achieve the adoption of standards. And it's in the first instance to be a solution for all size ports and terminals. Um, so where there are port community systems, we're connected and we connect the ecosystem. So we connect not only the terminal, but local customs, uh, the uh, feeder vessels, the trucks, the rails, and this is where data starts to become powerful when it's not just shared between two parties, but actually the entire ecosystem works from the same uh, sheet music. They all know exactly when the vessel's coming in. They know when something's discharged. They know when it's ready for pickup. Uh, they know that it's out the gate and, and on the rail and on its way. So I think uh, 
the commission of the, the team has focused in on the exact right topic in terms of by getting standards, we'll be able to share data more efficiently. Um, so yes, having connected hundreds of terminals and rails, et cetera, you know, we see the adoption of the standards now gaining a lot of momentum starting to take off. We're publishing all of our APIs to make them visible for anyone who wants to take part of them. We, anytime we create an API, of course, we are in touch with DCSA uh, to ensure that what we're creating is aligned with what is being published by uh, the community. So it's very important. Everyone likes, is for standards, but they would like their standard to be adopted. What yeah. is, we have to get past that. This yeah. is, we're all in this together. Uh, so we have to be able to do that. So in closing, I, I would say uh, together we can work to support the adoption of, of the digital standards um, and go, we should go beyond just events, but get into the documents, digitizing the documents, enabling them to be shared by APIs will create those efficiencies that we need because it is all about getting cargo off the pier faster, getting cargo to the shelves, store shelves faster. Uh, so yeah, in closing, I think it's just, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to this topic. It's important we get it right. It's important we move forward as an industry because the end result has to be we're increasing cargo velocity through our ports where we are behind compared to some of the global areas in terms of productivity and, and standards can help with that. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, great, uh, great uh, discussion from all of the uh, of all of the participants today. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned, I think, Tom, the uh, uh, World Wide Web, and uh, and for and I always sort of think that the most important uh, uh, invention of, of recent times was was not the World Wide Web, but was intermodalism, containerism, uh, because you can talk and communicate all you want. But if you can't move something from place to place, uh, uh, you can talk. And right. so, uh, so the movement of goods is uh, critically important. We're seeing it right now in terms of inflation uh, in the United States, uh, challenges moving all of the products. And we have just in time delivery requirements for all the manufacturing. And so if any little widget is missing, uh, we, we have to slow things down and we come to rely on it. But the complexity of of the movement system is so great right now that we need to to do better. Um, and I, uh, Dominique, uh, your comments about setting standards that are workable and and not so prescriptive that they uh, price someone out of the business of, of of providing information, I think, are the challenge that we we face. How to how to come up with enough information that can be used uh, in a neutral way uh, by equipment that's out there. Uh, will be one of our challenges. Uh, um, but Gordon, I wanted to talk uh, to you, ask a, a question about, uh, we're, we're trying to come up with, with a process of, uh, of coming up with a common lexicon that could be used. And there's a lot of the lexicon that we have out there in the industry, but is there a way we can uh, streamline uh, uh, integrating uh, definitions into to standards? What would be your recommendation on on how to make sure that we, we get to a point where we can come up with a uh, standard for a lexicon and, and um, what's the way to do it the best. Um, so I can only tell you that, again, somebody's gonna go there. So, so I can only tell you that different communities approach this challenge in different ways. One of the first things in a new technology area that generally gets standardized is the terminology itself, right? Because you can develop a standard for the exchange of data, but if the terms don't mean the same thing to the person who input the data and the person who's outputting and using the data, then the data exchange isn't very valuable. Um, so this idea that there's actually a defined terminology standard that everybody shares, maybe is one of the things that has value first. Uh, perhaps if a lot of standardization work has already been done and definitions are part of that standardization work, um, doing a standards landscapes can and getting a conglomerate of all the def definitions for the important terms in the container industry uh, and the, and the um, supply chain issues that come along with it um, would be valuable in seeing how much difference there really is in that use of terminology. And then perhaps kind of agreeing to come together in one place and look at all those definitions, ask ourselves the questions, 
Is this the right set of definitions? Do we need this all? Because sometimes we get overdefined. We end up defining terms that don't matter, and we end up spending time and energy defining terms that don't matter. For those that do matter, ask yourselves, is there a common definition already, or is there more than one? And then the next harder question is, can we get to one if there's more than one? Um, beyond the terminology standard, which might be at the core of this, there would be the idea of an ontology. Um, and so in some of these complex transactional environments, you don't just need a set of definitions, but you need an ontology, which is kind of a different name or a different approach to a lexicon, which prevents a terminology hierarchy that can be relied on in the standardization system. So these kind of core layers that set the foundation for the ability to not just exchange ones and zeros, but to actually exchange the meaning of the data in a reliable way are really important. Uh, Dominique, um, uh, you mentioned in, in your discussions the challenges of getting our industry, the maritime transportation industry, focused on adoption is one of the major uh, challenges. They're sort of dealing with operational issues on a day-to-day -day basis, and sometimes these sort of things slip. Um, uh, what, one of the reasons we're doing this is we're trying to elevate this issue to, to say that as an industry, we probably have to pay attention to this. Uh, but could you elaborate a little bit more on, on some of the uh, obstacles that you've, you've been facing as, a, as an association, getting, uh, getting uh, 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 standards uh, implemented and, and adopted? Um, yeah, well, there are a couple, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it comes down sometimes to what I mentioned before. So simply we have something else to do today and we'll, we'll get to it tomorrow, but then, you know, when it's tomorrow, it's again, something else, uh, legacy systems were mentioned by Tom too. Uh, it's not that in, in container shipping, um, digitalization doesn't exist. It might've been a bit too early in some cases, uh, uh, it, it dates back, uh, things like Edifac date back more than 30 years ago. And this is when the initial systems, both on the private and public sector side, uh, were initially created. And, and, and sometimes they, they might have become certain monsters, or, or I, I sometimes also compare it to, to card houses, where it becomes very difficult to take on one part, and then uh, there's a chance of the whole thing collapsing. So legacy systems and making that change is, is very difficult. Another thing is, is we see it at, at the sea level, there is not always the right uh, attention for it. Uh, again, talking with the people, fine. But when it comes down to making choices, providing budget, providing the priority to the staff on the ground to actually start working on it and implement it. Yeah, that's, that's where sometimes the, yeah, the, the, the prioritization lacks. And that's, that's where we also think that the FMC initiative um, uh, is, is, is very important. To, to bring it up to that level and to show the importance. And unfortunately, um, by the US and other parts of the world, there had to be a crisis uh, 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 in terms of supply chain to, to bring it up there. But I don't think we're fully there yet. Uh, we see a lot of improvements. We see a lot of attention. Uh, but uh, yeah, th those would be a couple of things that, uh, um, yeah, that, that we really see. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kristen, uh... Monaco is our, our chief economist, and I want to see if you wanted to, to ask any questions. Or, or your, you said your power is short, uh, potentially, so uh, I was almost afraid of asking you, but go ahead if you wanted to ask a question. Uh, yeah. Happily, they haven't cut the power yet. Um, right. So I had a question that I think each of the panelists might be able to provide some insight into. Um, as Commissioner Bensel mentioned earlier, there's a whole sort of set of stakeholders in the supply chain that are very small, right? So either your small importers, a lot of your exporters who just really have a need for an amount of information that they currently don't have, right? Where's my freight or what, what port do I need to get it to and when and when is it going to be on a ship? And a lot of these sort of standards and standard settings really seem to be focused on the big players because it's easy, I think, to get them in a room and try to get coordination. Or as you heard Tom talk about how his, how Trade Lens tries to coordinate with DCSA. And so I wanted to sort of pick everyone's brain along sort of the panel on how you make sure that sort of these smaller 
players in the system who don't necessarily have the same access to technology are brought in and are able to benefit as much as the bigger players. Yeah, I think I think that's a very pertinent point, Kristen. I think what we see is we try to look at it um, on a per user basis, user type. Um, so regardless of the size, you know, the fundamentals, of course, that it has to be easy for them to adopt. You know, so it can't be a big change. And I think the positives that I see is even the smallest players are looking to simply and inexp inexpensively leapfrog their current capabilities in technology. So the standards are, are helping them. I don't think they mind which standard it is as long as it's easy to adopt and it, they get some efficiencies out of it. And I think that's where we have to be sensitive uh, because you're right, if we're doing just a top-down exercise and everybody else, you have to live with it, uh, the adoption uh, will, will suffer for it. So um, I'm gonna chime in on something that Dominique brought up, which is don't lead with the standard in itself being the value, lead with the business case. What will these smaller operators get out of participating and then adopting these kinds of standards? What will be their gain in efficiency? What will be their gain in profitability? And, and come to them with that business case um, in addition to that, one of the other things we've seen is that the pandemic really has provided a standards development opportunity, right? So typically standards development meetings happened in one place, mostly in person, even in today's world. And there's some real value to the relationship buildings that happened, has happened historically in those one person in-person meetings. But we have seen a rapid development from uh, standards development organizations and their ability to host meaningful standards development in a completely virtual setting where the participants never see each other in a room and the work gets rapidly brought together. Uh, so I think combining those two things and leading with the business case rather than they were going to make a standard, but here's what we are going to do and here's what it means to you and your company and here are the benefits associated with this work, participating in this work and adopting this work. And then It'll be easier than you thought it was because you aren't going to have to travel to Geneva, Switzerland and stay there for a week, but we're going to do it, you know, every Tuesday morning for an hour and a half virtually. So I think there's a couple of ways to help bring smaller players to the table that A, weren't really part of the standards development process before from practicality perspective, but also I think that communication and leading with the business case is core to getting smaller players to the table. Um, yeah, well, adding fully to that, um, the smaller players uh, maybe shouldn't be worried uh, uh, about digital standards in the first place. They shouldn't be worried about 50 different timestamps in a port call. They shouldn't be worried about eight different definitions of a consigner. And they shouldn't be worried about how different applications use them. Uh, it's similar to what was mentioned before, Wi-Fi, the World Wide Web, email. Nobody has to question how it works or needs to be necessarily involved. And even though we would like them really a lot to be involved, I think that for the smaller players out there, if you're, if you're exporting cheese or something like that, uh, you should be focusing on that cheese. And I wouldn't trust any cheese of any farmer that, that is an expert in digital standards, to be honest, that, that there's some, there would be something wrong. Um, but what is important there is that the solutions, the services that these parties use, that there there are these underlying standards implemented by the different solution and service providers, making sure that that small business owner can just do his business and not worry about whatever is happening in the background. Well, I mean, it's the ease of access, I think, is summing up that you've all mentioned. If, if, if there are smaller operators, if you send them a spreadsheet and you're a trucker waiting to pick up a load, uh, that spreadsheet's basically virtually uh, unuseful. Uh, so, so there's got to be some standards about accessibility, and it probably has to vary depending on the parties that, uh, that, that are out there. Uh, Kristen, you want to, do, uh, you, you have another question? Um, no, sir, it's four o'clock. So I think I'll defer the last question to you. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I mean, it's interesting, uh, interesting hearing from all of you, your, uh, uh, from the macro, macro perspectives of NIST to where you are used to setting standards and the process that you use 
uh, to DCSA, who's been doing a lot of work in the maritime transportation area. And we've, we've spoken before quite a bit uh, and we'll continue to, uh, to, uh, to, to work with you because of, of the work that you put in this and, and, uh, and Tom with uh, Trade Lens. So it's a platform that uses all these standards. So if we can upgrade the standards that are there uh, to make them more accessible, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see more uh, dissemination and utilization and, and performance as a result of the use of your, um, your, uh, um, of your platform. So uh, I think uh, it's a really interesting perspective that you've all provided uh, we're going to continue uh, along the lines uh, that were suggested by uh, Gordon to uh, try to incorporate as many uh, comments and as many uh, uh, conversations as possible, uh, reaching out to as many uh, different uh, folks. Uh, we are going to be looking at a, a summit, uh, I think, in June, early June, as I mentioned. Uh, we'll be inviting all of you uh, to participate. Should you? June 1st, June 1st, I think yep. we got we got it set, so I can say that. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we really do want to make sure that we set up uh, something that can work uh, for everybody. Uh, and uh, and at the end of the day, it's it's my view that we we need to set a standard here. Uh, the costs the costs in trillions of dollars uh, and inflation uh, uh, caused by delay and congestion challenges. Uh, which are not all part uh, and parcel of, of uh, the industry's fault, uh, uh, show how valuable it would be to set up a better system of communication and, and movement uh, with standards for information. Um, uh, they still have to move the cargo, but, uh, but better, uh, right? I talked to a port director the other day. They told me that they were getting information about the movement of ships by email. Uh, but my gosh, you know, if you had an uh, airplane uh, transporting uh, passengers and you were getting an email from them on a periodic basis, and, and we can do better, we can do better. So, uh, but I, I really don't, uh, I, 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 we will be working with all of you uh, going forward. We appreciate your, your advice and your suggestions, and uh, I think we'll, we'll take you up on it. So, uh, uh, there'll be further uh, discussion. So with that, I don't have anything else that uh, uh, I need to bring up. And so uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it.